Okay, can you all hear me? All right, good afternoon. Um, I'm Ezekiel Dixon Roman, and welcome to the Control Society Speaker Series. This speaker series features nationally and, and internationally renowned scholars and thinkers that are doing work on data, algorithms, and new media and their intersections with governmentality, power, and formations of difference. Co curated by myself and Justa Lingle uh, of the Annenberg School for Communication, Control Societies is supported by a Provost Excellence Through Diversity Fund grant, the School of Social Policy and Practice, the Annenberg School for Communication, and the Price Lab for Digital Humanities. Today, we have the honor to have Elizabeth DeFredis here to share her work with us. Elizabeth DeFredis is a professor in the Education and Social Research Institute at Manchester Metropolitan University in the UK. Her research focuses on philosophical and, and historical investigations of mathematics, science, and technology, pursuing the implications and applications of this work in contemporary learning sciences. She writes extensively on social science research methodology, exploring alternative ways of engaging with digital data. She has published five books and over 50 chapters and articles on a range of topics across the social sciences and humanities. I have had the privilege to work with Liz on two projects. One was a special issue that we co-guest edited with Patty Lather in Cultural Studies Critical Methodologies on alternative, alternative Ontologies of Number, Rethinking the Quantitative and Computational Culture. And the second was another special issue that we did in uh, the journal Research and Education on the Computational Turn in Education Research, Critical and Creative Perspectives on the Digital Data Deluge. She is one of the sharpest, meticulous, and creative scholars I have come across. I'm very excited that she's here with us today and to hear her talk on the biosocial subject, sensor technologies, and worldly sensibility. Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth DeFredis. Thank you so much for, um, for coming, and uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm just going to see if I've lost the mouse somewhere. Do I? I can just use this. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, if everything's clear, can you hear me? Talk? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, okay, so what I want to talk about today is um, the biosocial subject. Um, and biosocial research is at the vanguard of a radical reconfiguring of education research, um, merging research methodologies from the life sciences and the social sciences. Such research is increasingly being advocated at, na in, at national policy levels, uh, particularly in the UK where I work, um, but elsewhere sometimes going under a different moniker. Um, and it's responding to scientific developments and paradigm shifts in various disciplines. So many of the contemporary biosocial interventions, however, are being harnessed to highly conventional reductionist models of learning conceived in terms of faster or more effective transit through predefined stages. Biopedagogies, as they have been called, are being used with children and adults to track and modify attention, engagement, decision making, emotional states, motion, performance, and creativity. The sensor technologies that are um, central to this kind of research carry serious ethical implications as they permit new levels of intervention into, um, into the bodies, mental states, and conduct of uh, students and children. Moreover, behavior interventions are typically grounded in normative assumptions based on control or correction um, of bodily phenomena that irritate dominant notions of proper conduct. So fidgeting, you know, children fidgeting in classrooms, repetitive gestures, um, noises, noisy children, agitation, that kind of thing. Deployments of biotechnologies to track such behavior are easily and often rightly critiqued on ethical and um, or pedagogical grounds as serving a kind of nightmare image of the control society. It's also important, however, to move beyond the agonistics of critique and towards creative experimentation and the development of new theory. The shift to the biosocial is exciting for many reasons, not least um, in that it allows, it allows us to attend to capacities that are often overlooked or poorly understood in conventional um, educational research. Biosocial data in itself could support different kinds of explorations using the concepts of emergence, threshold, affective intensities, and creative experimentation, attending to the aesthetic dimensions of learning environments and tracing affect and sensation that conventional research methods fail um, to encounter. 
So Nicholas Rose, for instance, suggested that the time might be right for, um, quote, an affirmative relationship with an emerging new and non-reductive biology of human beings and other organisms in their milieu, which can thus be brought into conversation with the social and human sciences. So this presentation um, focuses on how biosocial research might uh, generate new forms of experimentation that take up scientific knowledge beyond the procedures of normative um, social science. And my aim, uh, I believe, resonates with a whole bunch of other scholarship that um, it's worth putting up here on the slide. Um, and by the way, I can certainly share these slides with anyone who's interested. Um, so there's a lot going on. I mean, I'm linking up with uh, people like Des Fitzgerald, um, Frost, Wilson, and others. And um, these are all attempts to kind of think and study the nature culture mixtures in new ways, and including feminist science and technology studies um, and other kinds of new materialisms, let's say. Um, so uh, on the other hand, you know, this seems kind of like an enthusiastic bunch, I guess, most of it. Um, I am sensitive to the fact that ebullient affirmations of the force of the biochemical without adequate critique, as sometimes found in current work on affect, need to be interrogated and interdisciplinary projects across the social and biological sciences are often sites where, um, as Des Fitzgerald says, the biosocial nexus starts to look distinctly biocentric. So the primary aim of my talk today will be in the area of conceptual development around this paradigm shift, with particular focus on how new biotechnology might be used to study a more than human worldly sensibility. So specifically, my aim is to show how biosensor data uh, might serve in further developing post-human theories of learning. So there's lots of um, uh, sort of good images to, to bring forth, just sort of to fu for fun and, sh and shock value. If not, I'm not sure if you find this shocking or, or beautiful, perhaps. Um, all sorts of stuff that's going on in um, the learning sciences um, using various new biotechnologies and sensor technologies. So the term sensor technology is used to reference all technologies that produce sensory data about the body or the environment, so movement, temperature, air quality, arousal, light, etc. cetera, um, while avoid, avoiding techno fantasies, either utopian or dystopic, uh, my aim is to trigger imaginings about the potential use of these kinds of biotechnologies in education research. And I offer an argument as to why social science researchers might reclaim and repurpose sensory digital plugins, um, subverting the interests of the control state by showing how such data actually points to the profoundly relational and materially distributed nature of learning. So there is also uh, another kind of, kind of area of research, for instance, the 2015 book on biohacking by Cara Platani, um, who tracks uh, she's a science journalist and she tracks the kind of grindhouse denizens, as, as she calls them, who are bent on modifying their own bodies with sensor technologies, so implanting um, magnets into their fingertips and, and things like that to kind of increase their sensory capacity. Um, this paper is not about that kind of biohacking, um, although I'm very interested in it, and there are implications, I think, for how we make sense of that kind of biohacking in terms of the argument I make today. Um, in learning theory, there is a need to formulate a, a new bioethics adequate to 21st century new empiricisms um, by reclaiming biodata that all too often is used to pathologize the individual human body. So I argue that digital microsensors produce evidence of a more than human worldly sensibility. This theoretical reframing of, um, of, bio, of biodata is an important step in addressing some of the political concerns associated with the biosocial subject that Claire Colebrook and others have raised. And I think it's important to consider how this rapprochement between the biological and the social sciences is occurring at a time when biology itself is undergoing significant change as it becomes increasingly computational and data-driven. This new bio Biology 3.0 aims to operate without the biological digital divide, merging wet and informatic perspectives into one all-encompassing scientific practice. Um, this kind of transformation in science, and, and in this case biology, um, indicates a kind of new biological digital, digital social mixture that entails new ways of understanding our quantified selves. So in pursuing this project, I hasten to remind readers that the term biosocial remains problematic, um, or ha sorry, sustains probably the problematic associations that it's always had. Um, 
so there should be a, yeah. Um, this is uh, just a slide. Um, it's a book by um, uh, Adam Perkins, and it's, he's a British um, scholar looking at the welfare trade, so looking at kind of links between um, uh, welfare and the kind of ongoing production of bodies through welfare experiences. And uh, clearly a problematic associations, and in this case, it's kind of an interesting story about how this book was received in the UK. I'm not sure if it was um, noticed here. Um, so we have to keep these historical and contemporary links in mind as we consider a possible connection between biology and so the social sciences. And to that end, my aim is to develop a particular approach to biosocial research that shows how digital biodata belongs to learning environments rather than to individual organic bodies. I focus on uh, wearable biosensors that are commonly used to tap the human body for physiological data. Wearable sensor technology is now a common way of collecting data from the human using new digital microsensors worn on the skin. And here I focus on electrodermal base bracelets, which are said to offer clinical quality observation and monitoring of temperature, movement, blood volume, pulse, and electrodermal activity. And I discuss in particular one such bracelet produced by Empatica, the company Empatica, a company that focuses on affective computing and data analytics. So Empatica designs and sells wearable digital devices for clinical quality sensing of EDA, amongst other things, and serves hospitals and research organizations such as um, MIT, Intel, Sony, Microsoft, and what have you, and many other universities where, wherever there's interest in biometric um, data. So again, I chose, I think, a scary Im couple of images. The, um, the Empatica bracelet is the black one there on the left. The white um, bracelet. Those comes from, come from a, an ad I found online that I thought was particularly scary, the way it linked the married, the married uh, female hand with the child or the infant's um, leg. Um, okay, so just to give you an idea of what um, the Empatica bracelet, one of the, one of the Empatica bracelets looks like. So um, I work with ideas from Elizabeth Wilson, John Protevi, and Mark Hansen to argue that such technical intrusions produce evidence of an impersonal, worldly sensibility infusing and sustaining an ecology of material practice. This approach recasts biosocial research as the ecological study of complex dynamic systems and what Hansen calls atmospheric media. I argue that electrodermal digital data belong to the charged learning environment and that we must find ways of framing that, that data in terms of the dynamic fluctuations and entanglements of, the, of that environment. So this, this approach troubles the very idea of organism as the unit of inquiry and thus differs from related epigenetic research um, which continues to focus on the organism insofar as um, it responds, quote, to the environment through epigenetic regulation of gene expression. So um, my approach is then to try and trouble some of the assumptions of post-cybernetic organicism found in current epigenetic research, which treats the social as signal and continues to operate within a single causal arrow between the environment and the individual organism, um, albeit granting significant force to the environment, and hence you get projects like um, the welfare trade. Um, so rather than claim that the environment becomes embodied in the epigenome and rather than focus on trauma and pathology, um, like most epigenetic research, um, I read biodata as part of the radical exteriority of experience and as evidence of the inhuman forces at play in any milieu. So this approach takes up the notion of signal quite differently, um, reimagining the inherent technicity of matter and life. Um, and emphasizing how digital media sense and, act and actuate below the time scale of the human. So Mark Hansen argues that digital biosensors plug into this worldly sensibility and suggests these new digital intrusions are able to access what he calls the primordial sensibility and, quote, enjoy a sensory domain all their own, end of quote. New mobile media um, can be studied less as cyborgian extensions of human faculties and more as registering the environmental, environmentality of the world. And to the extent that digital sensors are not mimicking or magnifying human perceptual organs, but instead expanding um, the distribution of more than human sensation, this seems to be a valid point that Hansen's making. Um, 
Moreover, this seems to entail what Hansen calls a media-driven transformation of human experience itself, and thus a move from an agent-centered perceptual modality to an environmental sensibility. So this paper explores the ways in which sensor data at micro scales forces us to imagine life quite differently and to seek the inorganic potentialities and inhuman forces by which a body can, as Kohlberg says, branch out into territories beyond its own self-maintenance. And my interest really is in how this approach might help us think about learning theory differently and how it might direct our attention to trans-individual um, dim dimensions of learning. So the Empatica E4 bracelet um, or wristband is designed to record uh, continuous real-time data during waking or sleeping hours. It contains a three-axis accelerometer that tracks motion, an infra infrared thermopile to track temperature, a photo um, plethysmography sensor and that, that measures blood volume pulse um, from which heart rate, heart rate, rate variability and other kinds of cardiovascular features can be derived. And it also contains an electrodermal activity sensor, so EDA, um, which is quote unquote, um, according to Affectiva, used to measure sympathetic nervous system arousal and to derive features related to stress, engagement, and excitement. End of quote. Um, so as Hansen suggests, these biosensors are not operating prosthetically because they engage with the body in a more distributed and unconscious way and thus have no correlate to the usual embodied organs, but instead seem to transcend the very notion of organism while still paradoxically mobilizing embo embodied forces. The affective, the affective computing lab at MIT, where this uh, bracelet was developed um, and is used um, or initially used primarily with um, um, epileptics, actually, um, to help um, diagnose or um, prevent um, seizures. So um, the lab at MIT uses these bracelets in a multitude of projects to study skin conductance associated with stressful activity, tracking the variability of how people express stress physiologically. Most of the projects are entirely focused on how such data belongs to an individual human body and how such data is the expression of affect possessed by that individual human body. In addition, projects affiliated with a lab that are focused on learning assume that such data underscores the cognitive achievements of the individual body. So one such project studies children as they play with Lego blocks, um, and researchers in this project claim that wrist EDA sensors show that, um, quote, children are excited to take on new responsibilities but are then quickly discouraged when they aren't given the resources to succeed, just in case you doubted that. Um, they also claim that children didn't always recognize their own achievements, which I think is quite an interesting part of the research, based on the EDA data. So the EDA data, um, the skin conductance data, um, seems to be a better accurate way of determining um, when children have accomplished something or not. Uh, so rather than using facial expression or verbal and other visible activity, these researchers point to EDA as, as, um, as an indicator of accomplishment or achievement. So the aim of the, the LEGO project is uncritically industry-oriented, as the researchers claim that, quote, by using skin conductance sensors, we can help companies better understand the unique perspective of children and build experiences fit for them, end of quote. This research is thus explicitly invested in using the EDA data to serve corporate interests as they redesign and personalize learning experiences um, that maximize the individual child's um, effective engagement as well as their accurate evaluation of their embodied actions. These aims together reveal how so much of the EDA research inspired by the emerge, emer and emerging from the MIT lab um, is based on a desire to correlate and also control the degree of intensity in any learning experience and to cultivate self-regulation of affect in children. Um, so at Empath, um, which is an associated company of, um, of Affectiva, a company that pursues um, empathic design through rigorous science, is their logo, um, EDA data is there used to show when people are excited or unexcited, engaged or disengaged, and stressed or not stressed. So in learning experiments, the data is typically used to show when affect interferes with or supports a goal, a learning goal. So empath, ins um, 
interprets fluctuation in skin conductance as evidence of stress when, for instance, the EDA graph shows a series of hills and troughs during the experiment. Um, and um, they interpret large singular spikes in EDA as excitement or severe anxiety and trailing off usually as disengagement. Um, but of course, there are serious problems with interpreting the data in this way. So um, in the figure that you're looking at here, this is from the LEGO um, project. Um, so the EDA data is from a child is shown while he uses some building blocks with his mother. So the EDA data is said to correlate with two possible scenarios, the first tracking positive excitement, um, the second negative anxiety. So the orange um, increase in EDA activity is either um, uh, positive excitement or negative anxiety. So these in two, two interpretations underscore the inherent ambivalence of this data. Um, the falling graph, um, the yellow part, marks the boredom of a child, perhaps, as he watches his mother build a block toy, followed by the positive excitement and fluctuation of the EDA when the child works independently, or the yellow part um, represents the calmness of the child while he watches happily his mother build a block toy, followed by the negative stress and fluctuation of the EDA when he anxiously builds independently. So the data does not definitively indicate one or the other, although the researchers state that the boy may send slouches and begins chatting about the blocks, losing interest in what his mother is doing during the first minute. So they, they have a particular, so they, they use other data to help them interpret this. Um, <clears throat> so the main textbook on EDA research was written in 1992 by Buxan with a second edition recently published in 2012. EDA is part of a larger set of electrodermal biosignal data, um, which are now the most commonly used data in psychophysiology. Despite the widespread use of such data, electrodermal phenomena are not fully understood. EDA refers to all possible electrodermal data more generally, so it could also include PET and fMRI and all of that kind of scanning kind of technology. Um, electrodermal experiments with humans and animals have a long and checkered history, of course, including horrific um, public displays, displays of the power of electricity to shock animals into submission or death, um, and of course discredited liar detection devices and other experimental intrusions um, instruments rather that have been said to correlate electric current with social disposition or electric current with competency. Um, Bertucci and ben Pancaldi recount episodes in the history of medical electricity tracking scientific interest in the electri electric body. Um, over many centuries. Um, Galvani's theory of animal electricity was published in 1792. Galvani was the scientist who um, attached frogs' legs on his roof during thunderstorms, um, thunder and lightning storms, to study the um, electric body. Um, but even before its publication, um, when uh, uh, in the medical electricity was forging all sorts of new kinds of empiricisms during those centuries. Um, and electric shocks of various kinds were said to, um, to help and support people. So I mentioned this kind of um, you know, complicated um, checkered history um, just to situate the work that we're doing now in the context of, um, of our ongoing interest in the electric body. And with this history in mind, I attempt to reconsider potential uses of the new electrodermal technologies that tap the electric body without violent intervention, um, in this case, passively collecting data about the electrophysiology of the body. My argument, however, is not that EDA data is, um, is evidence of an emotion um, or affect possessed by uh, the human organism, but that skin conductance can be studied as evidence of the radical exteriority of experience and as evidence of the transitive, relational, and event nature of learning. Sensor data is profoundly indeterminate um, and thereby refuses to belong to any one organism, overturning conventional notions of learning from an agent-centered perceptual modality to an unequally distributed environmental sensibility. So this perspective underscores the need to rethink embodiment and the need to introduce, in Hansen's words, a more porous and less self-referential -refer um, conception of embodiment, a conception that understands the body to be a society of micro-sensibilities themselves, directly and atomically susceptible to technical capture. EDA data from E4 bracelets is purely differential. 
insofar as it marks a gradient or a rate of change rather than a definitive quantity that correlates with a particular level of affect. So there's always this, this it's, it's, it's always a, a change, a, a gradient. Measures of electrodermal data track changes in skin conductance. So these changes are linked to the skin's production of sweat, which is itself linked to the sympathetic nervous system, often said to reflect changes in arousal. Researchers distinguish between phasic data with lots of peaks that seem to mark arousal and tonic data that um, record gradual changes in quote unquote engagement. So the fact that there's always this differential element to the electric body helps us theorize a body that is charged but never static or still. Bodies are related rates of change. Um, each rate itself changing, so change of change of change. So you get this sort of infinitely differentiable image of the body through the, uh, through the electric, um, through the study of, the, of its electricity. The peripheral nervous system, extending the body into its frayed periphery, carries this charge in nonstop differentiated flows. It's as if individuation of a body is a massive related rates problem. Electrodermal activity points to the different speeds of becoming and the articulation of bodies as relations or ratios of speed and rest. Attending to the electromagnetic field is that which sustains the body. We can begin to study the provisionality of them and the microtemporality of their boundedness. Biosensors like the empatica bracelets detect activity below the perceptual threshold of the human. In this vein, the data in this in this vein, the data testifies to worldly sensibility, attending to the collective nature of radical um, of learning. These EDA devices help us track the provisional ground of learning and the distributed nature of it. So I'm interested in the way that EDA points um, to alliances, I guess, um, that are formed between various kinds of um, internal organic processes and more distributed processes like learning. Um, so it may, may well be that affect, affects and nerves and cells and skins and buildings um, all interact just in the way the speculative biology 3.0 might suggest. And rather than dismiss EDA data as irrelevant or insignificant or dismiss it for serving only to individualize and pathologize the learner, I want to trouble the all too easy anti-biologisms um, of uh, contemporary qualitative research and education and explore the entanglements of biochemistry, ecology and learning. So my focus on skin conductance is a way of attending to the neurological periphery, the far-flung electrical activity of the body, rather than what is assumed to be the center and administrator of that system, the brain. I'm less interested in the central nervous system, the spinal cord, um, the brain, although I have written quite a lot on um, uh, neuroeducational research and number sense in the brain and, and the ways in, you know, in which that research works. But following Wilson, um, looking at the periphery allows us to look at the distributed network of nerves um, that innervate and substantiate the body. The electrical charge that innervates the skin is at the periphery of the human body, but is, according to Wilson, participating in rumination, deliberation, and comprehension as much, if not more, as the brain. And the challenge, in my opinion, is how to engage with this EDA data without, on the one hand, simply acquiescing to the claim that biodata provides a factual foundation for learning, or on the other hand, repeating the doxa of social constructivism and dismissing it as, um, as uh, top-down or ideologically driven or only um, a negative expression of the um, biodogmatism of scientism. So the EDA is a testimony to the force of periphery activity, showing how the sympathetic nervous system, and I think the, the, this focus on the sympathetic nervous, nervous system in Wilson is really promising and interesting, um, showing how this system is involved in intense biological um, distributed agency. Wilson shows us how this, um, this peripheral um, nervous system actually dominates uh, the central nervous system in the transmission and distribution of crucial biochemical compounds such as adrenaline and serotonin. She argues that we must no longer treat um, the biological periphery as psychologically inert, nor treat biology itself as inflexible and an obstacle to politics. Investigating, um, investing in the speculative potential of matter, she uses recent work in physiology to argue that biological substance is as much phantasmatic substance 
as it is mechanistic. Um, so she argues that the, uh, the so-called um, biological bedrock of the body is robust with both physical and fantastic capacities, a claim that I unpack, unpack somewhat differently in this talk um, using Protevi's ideas through Deleuze of the virtual. <clears throat> so the implications for learning theory of Wilson's work um, are risky, as Wilson calls for the existence of organic thought and the biological unconscious, um, concepts which have an awkward psychoanalytic history. But these are also concepts that help us problematize um, the conventional coding of such data in terms of cognitive achievement, which is clearly how it's being coded um, in the MIT lab. Um, and certainly what it does is it kind of moves away from reading that data as evidence of an all-controlling central nervous system, directing our attention instead to the, uh, the dispersed nature of affect. So the skin sensors are one way to study this dispersed, fantastic um, capacity. Indeed, the skin, the skin occupies the quivering periphery of the bounded individual that we take to be the mark of the organism. The EDA skin data is thus perfect for showing how the bounded individual is always being broken down, um, disassembled, remade, intensified, and charged. Um, rather than treat synapse and society as disjunctive and antagonistic, one can use the EDA data as a way of tracking the blended world of the peripheral nervous system. At the juncture of the skin are mixtures of synapse, cilia, sweat, mind, and society, all percolating. Such a reading of the data might be biological, as Wilson suggests, but non-localized, chemical but non-deterministic, interior yet worldly. I suggest that these chemical and electrical actions are a means of modulating worldly sensibility, of ruminating differently with the world, and making the, or the organic periphery tremble. The EDA data points to our biochemical relationality, our bioaffective dispersal. This new, Im sorry, this new empiricism binds human and non-human together in reconfigured modes of existence, transforming human experience from, as Hansen suggests, from this agent-centered perceptual modality to a distributed worldly sensibility, but unequally distributed is obviously the issue. Um, we need to develop ways of studying this and it, through a kind of expanded sensory um, approach um, in, lear in the learning sciences. And my hope is to trigger new experiments in education in which EDA data might be conceived differently, not only in terms of biomarkers of personalized um, affect, but as evidence of something else. And so in the biosocial lab at, um, in Manchester, um, uh, where I'm co-director with my colleague Maggie McClure, we are trying to fund and um, support um, various projects like that. Um, this also involves rethinking the nature of digital biotechnologies, not as affordances or prosthetic extensions, but more in terms of, of the technicity of matter. So um, my approach considers technologies as somewhat indifferent to human interest and achievement. So you can see a kind of particular philosophy of technology that informs the projects, um, participating in the environment firstly um, and the individual secondly. So in other words, technology is not only a human invention, but part of a worldly process and this kind of intersects with uh, some, some particular philosophers of technology that we're, um, we're reading and working on. So rather than um, demonize the technology as an extraction device, and this is the, that kind of demonization happens a lot in my field in the qualitative research, while simultaneously um, this kind of technology is fully embraced um, in, in the field as well by other researchers. So um, you can see my argument is really trying to convince a certain set of researchers to investigate what this research can do for us. So rather than demonize the technology, um, we need to find better ways to think about these new kinds of digital plugins, different ways of understanding the significance of electrodermal activity. So the concept of the virtual is pivotal, um, in my opinion, in clarifying the approach to biosocial data. And so this is kind of interesting shift I, I make in the paper in the sense that I draw quite extensively from Deleuze and Hansen is not very happy with Deleuze's approach, so there's like a lot of tension between um, the, their, their work, and yet I would argue actually that I can work with both of them quite well here. Um, so the concept of virtual um, is pivotal um, and clarifies, um, I hope anyway, a lot of um, the ways in which we could think through the EDA data. Um, 
so following Protevi's lead, um, I argue that here that uh, Deleuzian notions of the virtual and more recently, of course, people in Deleuze studies are very interested in intensity and special issues on intensity have come out and so on. So this is another kind of key concept for Deleuze is intensity. Um, so I argue that these key uh, notions um, of the virtual and intensive individuation can be used to analyze microsensory data. Deleuze elaborates a distinction between the actual and the virtual as part of his attempt to build a pluralist ontology. By thinking through the role of the virtual in this data, we can begin to think differently about the capacity of a body, and this I believe is crucial in developing the bioethics of biosocial research in education. Deleuze offers a new way of thinking about bodily capacity, less as a fully individualized possibility awaiting realization, achieving its teleological goal um, through actualization, um, and more as a live wire or a differentiated field of charge. So body's capacity is precisely this terrifying charged potentiality um, and its ongoing unexpected worlding. So um, perception is not, um, uh, not the organized synthesis of this sensory surround, but involves another differentiation of already differentiated flows. So Protevi in his book um, uh, in 2013 um, argues that the virtual web of linked rates of charge um, sorry, my eyes are kind of, um, linked with storage of neural and other material processes is what characterizes the sensory confound. So um, it's a really interesting book by Protevi that he's written where he tries to bring Deleuze together with um, embodied cognition people and um, uh, various kinds of biological research. So crucial to this work is the fact that the relationship between the virtual and the actual is not one of resemblance. And um, the graph of the EDA data is, however, um, a rendering of microsensory bodily activity, right? But not, um, and indeed it represents, let's say, bodily activity in terms of differentiated um, or potential flow. Um, but the question of resemblance is a really big issue for anybody interested in the, bio the role or the, the force of the biological um, uh, in the social, let's say. Uh, breaking the rule um, of resemblance is crucial for reclaiming the electrodermal data as environmental or ecological rather than only representational of a particular body's properties. But even if we manage to eliminate simplistic notions of resemblance between sensation and sign, and of course that's a big part of Deleuze's project, let's say, not necessarily um, what is probably the concern today, because I think even if we do that, we are still faced with the usual assumption that this microsensory activity determines or causes the more macro bodily activity. So this notion of determination is at the heart of the dilemma concerning our use of biosocial data, um, haunting all attempts to bring the biological and the social sciences together. Protevi seems optimistic, arguing that Deleuze's work resonates with um, many ideas from the 4EA movement. So um, the movement in body cognition, the four EA is the four E's and one A, um, embodied, embedded, enacted, extended, and effective. Um, so people like um, Albert No, N-O-E, and a few others um, populate um, this particular area, this four EA area. Many of these theories still hold to the notion of the biological prior, so some kind of biological prior cause of the, the macro social. Um, that determines all biosocial expression, they say. <clears throat> Deleuze's emphasis um, on the virtual, argues Protevi, and I agree with him, um, has a kind of potential to work th with the, e, um, the 4EA differently, because um, what it does is it sort of rethinks the concept of determination. Um, so for Deleuze, determination, so how something might determine something else, is a robust process of differentiation a term he derives from three key ideas in mathematics. And these three key aspects of Deleuze's concept of determination, um, the undetermined, reciprocal determination, and the potential are all derived from the history of analysis and are mapped out in difference and repetition. And these are you know, very specific to um, uh, a, a particular kind of mathematics that it emerges in the 17th century, really. Um, but for Deleuze, this is how we can move away from uh, theories of uh, perceptual synthesis or conditions of perception 
um, and begin to imagine determination in a different way and then see how new sensations can be determined in this other way as part of a worlding process rather than a kind of simplistic causal process. Let's see how I'm doing for time. Okay, so um, what was on the next slide? Okay, so um, rather than uh, chase the sort of simultaneity of sensory solicitation and response, and rather than celebrate the tiny uh, delay um, that is between the sensation and the consciousness of it, let's say, or of the, the brain's consciousness of it, or the brain's marking of it. Um, so rather than chase that and sort of try and collapse that, let's say, as a kind of phenomenological affirmation of nowness or presence, or maybe even an affirmation of slow science, sort of, which we also hear as a kind of response to this work, I think. Um, so rather than pursue those two projects, we might instead study micro sensory data for how they plug into the virtual, the potential, or um, Hansen's terms, the futurity of matter. Um, so returning here to Hansen then, who says, rather than look backwards at the assumed to be completed event of sensation, um, so playing with the Lego and you know, being shocked by the Lego or excited by the Lego, so rather than see this as a complete event of sensation um, and our conscious but late arrival to that, um, instead, look into a futural matter um, that harbors unscripted potential or the virtual. So rather than confine the causal efficacy of sensation to past conditions, take up and analyze the data for how it plugs directly into a robust and ongoing unfolding sensibility or worlding process. The issue is how to avoid or resist the controlling hand of predictive analytics while still affirming futural matter. And given how sensor data is already being used to fuel predictive analytics extensively in education if, and elsewhere, it seems urgent that we develop this theoretical and practical approach to thinking the nature um, and exploring what this futurity actually could be. If there is a vibrant futurity animating matter, then we need to rethink forms of presencing that are not conventionally phenomenological. The present moment is more or less animated or intensified by an undecidable future, according to this approach, and following um, Hansen and some of the other people I've mentioned, it seems to suggest that the digital media play um, a unique role in this kind of futural matter. Um, so it seems as though the degree and intensity of that intensity um, of experience and the specificity of its affect, so the joy or the fear or the anxiety or the boredom um, that the boy feels, let's say, um, depends on our access and understanding of this kind of worldly technicity that sustains the undecidability of the future so that your future um, as that little boy um, remains open. So biosocial studies of active learning could then intend more carefully to how biosensors are imbricated in worlding processes. And rather than channels by which signals are relayed, biosensors are somewhat indifferent to human achievement or indifferent to bodily capacity. I suggest that such a perspective brings forth a new politics more adequate to the learning sciences today. Reckoning with this digital data deluge and the milieu requires a new form of um, thinking biodata, and everything hinges on how well we can live with this kind of data and operate according to it. So I have up here, I think, the, uh, oh no, I don't yet. Um, so Deleuze and Guattari offered a way of thinking about um, the political at diverse scales, tracking traits and flows of capital across the molecular and the molar, and in their claim that um, quote, every politics is simultaneously a macro politics and a micro politics. They shift focus to the molecular and imperceptible level and to what they call the micro fascisms that operate beneath and beside the human subject. This molecularization of politics has the potential to radically open up our research in new ways of attending to the biopolitics of learning. Um, this lovely quote um, from them, politics on the ground scale can never administer its molar segments without also dealing with the micro-injections or infiltrations that work in its favor or present an obstacle to it. So these micro-injections and infiltrations break through the skin. So again, I'm kind of thinking about the skins as much as I can through this paper and reorganize the bounded body according to new forces and new desires. 
The human body becomes a recombinant subject, engaged in distributed decision-making, networked forms of becoming. Um, according to Deleuze and Guattari, and, and also in Deleuze's book, uh, article on the control society, the individual is divided repeatedly, replaced by the individual, a term that um, is used to describe the traits that break free, perhaps like the charge on the skin, from the bounded human body, circulating as part of a biosocial economy. Global capital links the mobile individuals in a vast network that is highly flexible and trans-individual, um, both dangerous and um, important. Thus, the individuated human body upon which theories of labor and capital are built is disassembled through the concept of individuation and becoming imperceptible. So obviously, this is an insanely dangerous enterprise, but um, also exactly where a lot of the theorists um, I'm reading are going in order to kind of think the futurity of matter. So this approach underscores the way in which capitalism extracts value at all scales and at all speeds, whether it be from human qualities like race or gender, or from the labor of non-human electrical charges as they flow across um, dermal currents. So we're all too familiar with the threat of those who capitalize on this kind of precognitive data. Today's data industries use predictive analytics to target the operational present of this ne neuronal kind of bodily uh, sweat labor as a means of controlling the future. Surely all this granular sensing will lead to nothing else but more control. Indeed, is it not the case that biosocial research simply deprives, deprives us of our ability to shape how our sensibility becomes our own experience? So I tentatively um, suggest in summary that my answer is no. And here are two reasons for not simply resting with suspicion. Um, first, EDA data is not simply the recording and storing of human bodily experience, but is also a direct engagement or encounter with this kind of electric worlding that I've been talking about. And as argued above, this direct engagement is better studied by attending to the intensity and disparate speeds of um, dynamics of both individuation and the collective coordinated movement of um, ensembles or um, networks. And two, the problem is not so much the technical accessing of biodata, but the fact that such data is stolen to serve the control state. Um, EDA data is here, and we need to deal with it. Um, so with these two points in mind, we must not turn our backs on the technology permitting this data capture, but remain vigilant about studying the ways that this technology plugs into a more expansive worlding process. Indeed, if perception is part of learning, which is very much center, central to the learning sciences, um, it is because the differentiated virtual web of linked speeds is twisted and contracted at particular junctures or events to form a media event or um, perceptual event. So what is at stake here then in EDA research is a need to think beyond perception studies. According to Hansen, um, we need to sort of treat these biosensors as a media um, and other things as media, um, to study the way they operate as instruments um, as, and part of an experiential achievement, which is not necessarily only a human achievement. So it might be the case that we need to turn to some kind of climatology or some other kind of uh, framework yet to be formulated to track this kind of complex charged social space. The aim is, in my opinion, to develop a theoretical framework, and this is certainly what I've tried to do in this paper, that avoids the two dangerous poles of a kind of posturing scientism, um, which um, you may see, you may hear in, in this paper as well, but certainly you know, we can find in the education research and the learning sciences um, to avoid that pole, but also to avoid the kind of mystical obscurantism that um, some of the work around affect and the futurity of matter can, can end up in. So how do I kind of navigate this complex terrain where I want to work with the sciences, work with this, uh, and work with the philosophy, a Deleuzean-inspired kind of philosophy? So how might we avoid referencing this biodata as a singular cause of individuated ability in learning environments while also avoiding the mystical assignment of occult forces at work in matter? If the human subject is a kind of after image of material processes, what is the best way to make sense of the virtual or intensive nature of these electrical charges as they flit across the wet surfaces of our bodies? If reductive scientisms turn to biosensors like E4 to control the future, what kinds of experiments might we design to show how this intensity belongs to the learning environment? 
what kind of software analytics will help us analyze EDA data as ecological. Because learning theory theories are so entangled with theories of perception, I suggest that the biosocial movement might move towards a more broad understanding of sensibility, so away from the kind of epigenetic research that um, in, those, in that very first slide is really being explored um, in the UK by biosocial researchers. So the very notion of lived experience as that fundamental focus um, of most, if not all, research on learning becomes unrecognizable in a world of microtemporal biometric data that circulates and is absorbed at rates well below the bandwidth of human consciousness. The crucial thing here is that technology is no longer a surrogate for a human faculty, but instead operates directly on the sensibility of what Hansen calls the total environment, um, which seems to precede our own corporeal um, experience. The microsensors actually help us study this differentiated virtual web of learning. Thus, the EDA data can actually be seen as exposing the radical exteriority of learning itself. And the challenge is to take up this data without making it the biomar biomarker of some essential interiority or capacity possessed only or even mostly by um, the individual student, so as to better attend to the trans-individual nature of learning. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for giving me a lot to think about. <laughs> um, much of it very scary, frankly, from my perspective. And I sort of sense that some of it is scary for you. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and when I look at your summary statement, certainly the second one, I understand as a warning that we need to pay attention to what's happening. The first, your first statement, though, I'm a little less clear on your attitude. I mean, this is something that we should be optimistic about, or what, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I'm uh, working, you know, har hard to uh, re, you know, in the context of the biosocial research that's going on right now as we're, as we're sitting here, you know, within my field um, and being embraced by policy and by educators, you know, across the country. Um, I'm working really hard to sort of theoretically take it away from what I, what I consider to be a kind of reductive scientism and misuse of it. And so all the effort I've put into this number one is sort of to try and build this theoretical machine that can um, reappropriate that data and repurpose it really so that I end up saying, so I end up showing how it says something else than what other people think it's showing. So that's the project of number one, really, I guess, yeah. I mean, it just seems like the, the, the temptation for misuse of the technology is so great. I mean, to me, as an outsider, it seems pretty scary. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, we opened the biosocial lab at MMU in Manchester two years ago. Um, with, in, with like half a million pounds of internal funding. Um, and we, but our, we, and our website now, we've finally got up and running and our projects and stuff are quite clearly not aligned with mainstream biosocial research. So, um, you know, whether we'll be successful, right, in occupying or any of that territory or not, we'll see. Um, but um, what's interesting though in terms of um, you know, outside of education or the social sciences, this kind of stuff is used really creatively in the arts um, and or in geography. There's been like there's been a lot of really fun, interesting work with this, um, with these biosensors in geography, kind of remapping um, city landscape um, through these kinds of um, bio uh, biosensor data devices, and so. You know, there's, there is a lot of interesting stuff that goes on, but it's not within uh, the learning sciences or education research. So to the extent that that field can begin to learn a little bit about, you know, sort of to learn from others outside of it, see what they're doing and what, how they're learning, about, how people are learning about environments um, using this kind of uh, work. You know, that's, that's the big question is whether we can influence um, our field, which is education research. Uh, but I think, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's, Someone mentioned, I didn't mention him, he's in, the, in my paper though, um, 
there's a geographer in London who's used this really nicely to uh, create these incredible maps of London, um, which are part of an art project, you know. So they, they have a certain audience and they're enjoyed, but my project is to try and, you know, be to kind of do the science differently, really, right? So my project's not, as, as much as I'm, you know, a philosopher working at, you know, in, in, in philosophy, let's say, I still really want to be considered someone who's got a project that speaks to scientists. Um, and what I find is that, that, that there are, like, the, you know, if you, depending on who you speak to, you'll, you'll get much more reception for thinking this very different, different way. Um, people in the neurosciences often come out of psychology and are in quite significantly influenced by the image of science that psychology has. If you, talk, if you work with people in um, ecology or in physics even, and, or the, some of the computer scientists that I work with in Manchester who, do, um, who study artificial life, speculative life. I mean, you know, these are scientists who have, who have totally speculative perspectives on their practice, right? So I think we need to engage more with those, those scientists and not so much with uh, some of the reductive scientists, the, the scientists who have a slightly more reductive application of this kind of work. <clears throat> Excuse me, so let me follow up on that. Um, so first, thank you so much for a, a, a deeply engaging and absolutely thoughtful uh, talk. Um, and I'm, one of the things I always love about your work is the creative and even post-critical interventions that you're uh, often making and, and pushing us to, to do and, and social science research and education research and all. Um, I think, so right along the lines of, the, of where you were just speaking to is, is a rest that I'm constantly thinking about, right? So, how, how to do this work in a way that can get at the kind of relational ontologies that we're trying to get at, trying to, in many ways, not just philosophically, but even empirically demonstrate, and, mm -hmm. and what, to what extent we can even get at that, right? Um, in a way that can be convincing to the lens, of the, the reductionistic and essentialist lens of positivism, of positivists and even scientists, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I'm particularly, I mean, you mentioned psychologists. I, I mean, in education in particular, I mean, it's, it's psychology and, and economics as, as well that really has a dominant sort of perspective or, or, mm -hmm. or influence on, on, on inquiry, on experimentation, on the study of education or learning in and of itself. And, I, and I, I, I do wonder about to what extent is it, is it even empirically possible to demonstrate that where they'll fall back on, the tendency will be to fall back on mm -hmm. that same essentialist and reductionist kind of interpretations of the same data that we're looking at and seeing the vibrancy yeah, of. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, so is it empirical, more might even say, is it ideological? Right, I, I don't. I'm, I'm, I'm speculating. I'm wrestling. I'm not sure where, where, how, how to do that work. Yeah. And, you know. I mean, because I, I, the, um, what's her name? The the woman who heads the um, effective computing lab at MIT. I don't have her name here somewhere. She, um, um, where is it? Anyway, it's somewhere buried in there. But she does fantastic work with um, uh, people with severe um, epilepsy. I mean, really good work. And these, you know, mainstream research around how to help this individual organic body, you know, begin to anticipate when it's going to have a seizure, so, you know, turn, stop driving or, you know, what have you. Um, and so that, that's, you know, hugely significant and, you know, you want to value and validate that kind of research. So. But what you find on, on the MIT affective, what you find is like, like 25 other projects that are just so poorly conceived, in my opinion, Sign, poorly scientifically conceived. I know they're recording this, so. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, and I want to go there and speak to them about, you know, about learn what, you know, what it is that they're working with. So, um, I mean, to, to think more creatively about how you design your experiment in science is, we need to help people do that, right? Like, I mean, I think that if, you, if we consistently 
are using this kind of technology in a particular design, experimental design, then you will inevitably, you know, use, you will end up, you will inevitably decide that it is a biomarker of disability or ability or, you know. world and so if you're assuming the body nature uh, matter materiality is being fixed as being inert then you're gonna design studies yeah. around such and and will un inevitably miss the vibrancy of yeah those. exactly so it, it can you know what we want to do with we're, we're buying a whole iMotion set of around I don't know 20 or more of these devices and what we want to do is design experiments that we've not seen anyone else do, which is multi-body experiments. I mean, it's just kind of odd that no one's looking at the way, you know, f developing software to merge multiple um, data tracks of all of this, you know, uh, EDA data that's circulating and, and um, um, emerging. And so I think like when I, all of the experiments I've looked at so far, it's always looking at one body and the bio data that's attached to it. So design experiments with lots of bodies, with lots of bio data, and then design really interesting software that helps you. And it, the and the science, you know, then in the software, it comes down to what you do, right? Like how are you going to weave that data together? Um, and then of course the data representation question comes in hugely here too. How are you going to communicate that to um, to the school that you've just studied because you're trying to study the complex biosocial environment of a school, let's say. So um, how do you create a biosocial map of that school? Well, you're not going to take individual people out and, you know, create and say you've got this individual, this individual. You need to design some experiment that's really going to help you look for the merging of all that data. So I'm, you know, waiting and hoping to see more of that, and that's what we're trying to do in the in the bio lab, biosocial lab in Manchester. Um, but of course, it's early days for us because we've just started uh, about a year and a half ago. But, uh, so I think you were next. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you for your for your very interesting uh, talk. Um, so my my question has to do with you know in in in, the, in this slide you have um, three verbs you know study and deal with and attend attend. Um, too, and I'm 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 wondering about you know w what the balance of these these verbs actually are. Um, let me let me unpack that a little bit. So I'm, I, I come from a computer science background partly, so I'm speaking to some extent from the other side, you know, of the of the, uh, of the divide here as well. Um, it seems like you know uh, one way of studying, dealing with, attending is to you know simply try to build analytical models and you know sort of try to look at the, the kind of interactions that are actually happening and another way of thinking about these things is um, the way that in the humanities we tend to do which is to think of these as metaphors and and you know uh, in, in the way that the dominant scientific paradigms of the day become metaphors like we did for Freud and you know, information processing for, for the mind, etc. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, is our work as, as scholars in social sciences and humanities, is it so much to work with scientists in terms of helping them build models or build better models or build more you know, um, uh, more humane models in a sense, or is it more to, I, I don't want to use the word appropriate, but to take the metaphors that are emerging out of these fields and use that as a productive source of our philosophizing, for want of a better word. I'm, I'm also thinking of, you know, sort of debates about quantitative history that happened in the 1980s and 1990s that people say that this is too reductive, too essentialistic to, you know, do quantitative modeling about history. All we can do is to narrate and tell a story. But there's also a view that, you know, we can actually think of these things as complex dynamical systems that interact and try to, you know, 
in some sense build models which may in the end simply be models that are generators of metaphors rather than generators of predictions. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, because models are, <clears throat> yeah, scientific model, I mean, uh, I mean, the art of making a model wherever scientific field you're in I, is often, um, I think if I understand your, your point is that there's, how sh is, it, is the question maybe how should we conceive our, the project? Is the project to help people make better models or is the project to sort of think about the metaphors that emerge through our interaction across these disciplines of the between the humanities and the sciences? Is that the question or? You yeah, so I think my question is, uh, I mean, is it, is it one or the other or is it both? And in, in particular, how do you, in your work, when you collaborate with, with computer scientists and, um, or scientists generally, uh, what is the <coughs> nature of that collaboration? I mean, is it, are you, are you advising them in, yeah. in terms of the work that they do, or is it more a kind of, um, you know, sort of looking at and taking what they are doing and using that as, uh, in, a, in an interpretive yeah, uh, framework. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, there's a lot of different projects that are going on affiliated with our lab, but um, my own interest and recent um, work with uh, two colleagues in the computer science department was precisely around designing a project where I was trying to control the agenda, um, but they were very kindly on board with that. Um, and, uh, but it wasn't that we were going to that we that we appropriate what the computer scientists are doing, but in theory, a collaboration that's of reasonable, um, equal value. So different kinds of contributions, clearly, but of equal value. So, for instance, uh, what's uh, happened with um, with this project has been um, well. It's quite funny actually, because if it starts from me and my, you know, um, other co-PI, um, we, we designed this project, we want to go and study the biosocial, you know, environment of schools and work very hard at formulating a proposal that we think will be funded by an education, you know, research grant agency. But then we, when we go to the computer science department to work with our colleagues there, they look at our project and they say, what's your problem? I don't understand, what's the problem here? You know, we think we formulated a problem as, let's say, sensory ethnographers, you know, so if this is sort of from the you know, humanities or from the social science perspective, if we position ourselves as people who go and do sensory ethnography, um, and we just want to kind of start doing digital sensory ethnography of some kind, and that's, we're trying to make ourselves recognizable to our own field of qualitative researchers, right, so that's how we pitch it. When we go to the computer science department, they don't quite understand what an ethnographic descriptive project would be. So they say, you know, what's your problem? What's the problem that you're going to solve? Um, and so the question of like how you pose a problem, how you pose a well-defined problem, and who will recognize it as such is so complicated in these interdisciplinary ventures. So it, it's been, you know, it, I mean, part of the agenda here is to kind of change your way of doing your own practice through these kinds of encounters, right? So. You know, it's an ongoing thing, so I don't really position myself hard and fast any, anywhere disciplinarily at this point. Um, but um, you know, I do, I do see how our project is evolving and mutating precisely because we have these computer scientists who are working with us um, and, are the, and are trying to kind of understand our project in their terms. Right? So the other issue is um, the bioethics of doing this kind of work in classrooms. I mean, and you know, collecting this enormous amount of data and sort of thinking about how to cultivate data science, um, sorry, yeah, data science skills in youth. Um, again, that's a really big agenda for us because we work in education and we have, a, we have a sort of service perspective on, you know, trying to like address social justice or trying to kind of make the world better. And I'm not saying that our scientist colleagues don't, but that um, they, will recognize a problem as a basic science problem, right? Like, so to simply understand something better is a legitimate goal. Um, 
Whereas for us to get funding, we have to not simply understand something better, we have to say, and we will change it through these ways, right? So, um, yeah, so the complexity of these interdisciplinary projects are fascinating. So, uh, so, okay. Um, so the goal is to implement it in a school? Yeah. Um, so is this meant to be a case study of how everything is going on, or is it meant to be an experimental study? It's, it's both, yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, because, uh, you know, when it has multiple phases. So, um, phase one is uh, a basic science collection of data. Um, and phase two is experimental interventions in the built environment through various kinds of digital kinds of devices. So it's both. Um, thanks for putting up some of the, the pictures and graphics that you had with some links. I'm definitely going to look up that uh, Emoto type graphic that you had that, that showed the graph. Okay. Um, I've got a couple questions with, with that. Uh, and, and, and this ultimately is, is, is looking at how to interpret these things as positive or negative, like I think uh, someone else asked already. Um, I guess the first thing that I observed with it was that the timeline was actually only about two minutes. <laughs> yeah. and, and it seemed like a ton of, ton of peaks and troughs and, and different levels of experience, which I think this, this kind of points back to what you were saying about studying intensity. And uh, you also said that that was just a rate of change and not actually, not actually a measurement of, mm -hmm. of quantity. Mm -hmm. um, so my, my main question is, is like what other types of data are collected simultaneously to describe what's, what's happening there? Because I think with the way that the, the technology is indifferent to the human experience, those peaks and troughs could be someone really calmly doing problem solving and having some, some aha moments about what works in terms of stacking blocks, mm. or I, like this again speaks to not understanding what the actual scale is of, of, of those changes, but that could be as, as big as someone being really, really frustrated with their yeah. experience, not being, able to, not being able to build the thing that they want to build. Yeah, so, um, it's, yeah, so it's interesting. So if you're, gonna, if you're doing you know, good science with the EDA bracelets, then you, you wear them for a while so you can get a base for an individual. And then you can start to determine what's a peak and what's a trough, let's say, for particular um, bodies. Um, so that's quite often, that's not actually always done, but that in the literature of like how to design the, for the, the right experiment, that's suggested. And are those phenotypes, or would you call those phenotypes? For I don't know if I, I mean, yeah, I guess they, they would probably, yeah. I mean, and then the other thing is they quite often, um, like with the case of the boy, will, um, be definitively using other data sources to um, to interpret. So you know, facial recognition software. So we're the company that we're working with is iMotions, and they sell like the whole a whole package where you've got all these. You can have like multiple plugins in the software. We'll show you about oh, about eight different um, data feeds, um, and one of them is the EDA data. And then it's you know, and you, you, you it may or may not be correlated with the other data, and you can set up the timing appropriately with the video and everything else. So they try, you know, they don't, but they don't, it's interesting, so they are really at the forefront of the field, right? There's two companies, but iMotion is one of them. Um, but they don't, nobody has good software, nobody has a good way of bringing all that stuff together, right? Because it's just a very complicated task, and, they, and no one really understands what it means. Yeah, and it's very new. It's very so that's why, right? Like, op, like trying to kind of occupy the space right now, theoretically, is really important. I think. Um, so, do they give you the, the data, or do they give you only graphs of the data? You get well, you get the data, the raw data, which is you know, you know, sheets and sheets of. But like so the so it's you know so it's, te you know it's calibrated into um, into you know certain kind of seconds, right? So you're only getting you know you have to. You know, you have to, you get, there's a bit of modulating, modulating how it's being collected, but um, it's always discrete data, I guess. You know, you obviously you need to keep that in mind, but. Yeah, I think there's a number of wearable um, technologies that companies will only give you, they won't actually give you the raw data, they'll only give you even graphs yeah. of the data. Yeah, so. yeah, so if you buy um, one of these bracelets, usually just as an individual, you know, 
not accompanied, then usually, yeah, you just get graphs, right? I think quite often. So, hi. Hi, thanks so much for this. Um, I know very little about education research, so I'm coming to you from the History and Sociology of Science department here, and the scientists I study are sports scientists. Okay. So also a lot of sensor technologies and wearable yeah. technologies over there. And I've been trying to think about the whole time about, um, I, I mean, I love this, this idea of the sensor data as ecological data, not organismic data. It makes a lot of sense to me, and I was trying to think about where the pushback would come from. And it was on the other end, which has to do with what it's being correlated with, which I think is where some of your questions were. So, like the, I guess that, you know, learning, how are they, what, it, what is, what, how is learning being measured? Mm -hmm. And that that might be, if it's, if can learning be defined in your, or are there people in your field defining learning as an environmental fact rather than an individual fact? Mm -hmm. And then I could see this as being, you know, hugely valuable theoretical framework. But if, if as in the sports world, there are people who are interested in team sports and performance, you know, who wins, who loses, and maybe would then see sensor data as being ecological data about that team or something, there might be those researchers, versus researchers who are looking at individuals and who's going to win, then they would, they would in no way be able to or be wanting to envision their sensor data as anything other than a measure of what's going on in that individual body. So I guess I'm just looking for you know, this is probably education research 101, but are there camps that are defining learning as an environmental phenomenon versus an inv individual? Yeah, yeah, I mean, there, there are. I mean, I, I think the history of education research um, has been um, dominated by um, theoreticians like Piaget and Vygotsky, um, who are social psychologists in some sense, I mean, Piaget not so, maybe a little less than Vygotsky, but the psychology um, paradigm has really influenced educational research and the learning sciences. Yeah, so what happens in the very, usually kind of de in a decade or more delay is education research sort of suddenly begins to, to follow transitions in the humanities that have already occurred. So, you know, this, what they call the sociocultural turn or the sociopolitical turn occurs. Um, and the ecological turn, you know, is, is definitely afoot. There are people who, who like to think of, you know, learning in those terms. And, um, but I don't think we're as well equipped to do so. And so, you know, what happens is that when this stuff comes into the field, um, it gets gobbled up really quickly by the more individual projects. Um, and uh, the, the, the other folk who are interested in, you know, kind of a sociocultural perspective react badly because it's biology. And so they don't want to engage with it. And it, but in fact, what, we're, what I'm trying to do is sort of say, no, in fact, you can, yeah. There, there, there is a way to kind of think through this and still do the kind of work that you want to do. Yep. I was wondering if you've ever conducted or considered studies where the like application of um, like setting a distributed network of sensors and body data and like applying that into schools and seeing how that works. Have you ever looked at using that case study of implementing almost to like iterate back on the way the data is collected in the first phase, if that makes sense? Or I don't know if you've ever seen anything yeah. that's approached data analysis and collection in that way. In that, so kind of like using it to kind of loop back feedback and do what through the first uh, to kind of inform what might be more useful to oh. study in order to kind of help uh, the people that would be using that sensor data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Does that makes sense. Yeah, I, mean, I haven't seen um, that. I mean, I think the work at the MIT lab is really working ongoing relationships, you know, with um, people continuing to develop new um, technology to help. Um, people. So I think there is a kind of iterative process there um, or a kind of living lab 
um, approach to the development of the technology. Um, but in, in, I guess I'm thinking when you asked me the question, I was thinking about how, um, uh, you know, part of the concern is, you know, is how we can get these devices, but we don't really understand how they work and how, you know, so there's really easy access. And also part of the concern is that schools are, um, smart schools now are really well um, embedded with sensors of various kinds and, um, and no doubt in Trump's America will be increasingly so um, to, you know, track um, uh, the movement of bodies and then, and whether they're anxious or not, who knows, right? So. Um, I think that there's a major issue that you're raising, which is like, how do you make sure these people who are, most of us who are being sort of subjected or are being implicated in, in this massive um, production of data have some power and some ability to kind of rethink about how we want to use it. Um, and I mean, that's, that's like kind of the p political side of my, my interest, right? But I, and I want to see projects like that, but I don't have any examples to share with you. But ho hopefully, and if anybody has any, I'd love to, please get in touch with me. I'd love to learn about them, so. Um, about what was going on at the school, which I, I think may tie into this slightly. Uh, what is the goal? You are going to be gathering affective information and then utilizing it in the school in order to help them. Um, but that help comes in a variety of ways. Do you uh, help them in situations where they're nervous? Uh, is the idea that you're going to lower their general anxiety level or find out whether anxiety correlates with conflicts in a way of um, reducing conflict? Or is it to increase the broad number of the education which they get, like how well they do on tests and comparative to other schools? Mm -hmm. um, how are they expecting to operationalize the data? Yeah, so um, uh, in our case, it's all about um, architecture and the built environment. So what we're, what, you know, the, what we're doing is disassoci disassociating the data from the individual body in, and making it impersonal in some, some way. So um, very complicated project to do, you know, when you think about it. people want to know whether their temperature is up or not. Um, but, uh, but the idea is to create maps of school environments so to create a biosocial map of the milieu itself so we could begin to think about the built environments of um, schools. So this is sort of connected to um, school architecture in the UK. Um, in the last, um, in 2010, there was a massive, mass kind of movement in the UK realizing that all, a lot of their schools were really old, ill-equipped, there wasn't enough schools. Um, they probably don't need any more schools after Brexit, but um, they, um, so there's a really b a strong interest in um, how do you, you know, what, how do you make a learning environment, Amelia, you know, how do you change the built environment, that kind of thing. So this is a project that feeds into that. So all of those things you raised are um, precisely how this kind of stuff is usually used, right? Like to improve people, kids' scores on, you know, the um, national tests or what have you. So the project is a real deliberate refusal to do that. Very, very explicit. And, you know, yeah, that's what it is. With that, we'll um, end and thank Liz for her. Thank you.